Yes. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once more. And thanks to Archinet for their invitation and for the interest thank in the you. subject. Um, and obviously, thanks to everyone who's uh, uh, joined us for this for this presentation today. So I'd like to talk to you today about um, sustainability in cities of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, but in order to do so, I will have to take a step back and go a little bit uh, back to the beginning. About 8,000 years ago is what I consider to be the beginning. The Earth axis has started shifting. It's shifted by about two degrees, which was enough to cause a transformation to the global climate. And amongst that, the two bands to the north and the south of the, uh, equa of the equator um, have started transforming from what was grasslands into what we now consider to be deserts. And that includes, obviously, the Sahara Desert and the Arabian Desert. And these, tr these deserts obviously lacked uh, water, they lacked biocapacity, the, being the ability to produce useful organic materials such as food, and uh, they also lacked a, a moderate climate, uh, which has rendered most of this region uninhabitable or not suitable for human habitation, and leaving only a few locations um, where human settlements can actually emerge. And these, uh, these locations were sometimes at the edges of the desert, sometimes were in spe very specific uh, locations within, within the desert. So more than any other region in the world, I would argue that human settlements in this, the Middle East and North Africa have emerged against the odds. Uh, they emerged only in a very few locations that enabled or that sustained human settlements to happen. And they could only grow as much as their hinterland or the surrounding uh, areas around them could, could sustain them or could support them to do. Um, unsurprisingly, they've emerged where the water was, where fresh water, the groundwater or surface water um, allow them, but the more um, prosperous ones amongst them, the ones that grew better, offered more than just fresh water. Um, the coastal cities, for example, uh, offered accessibility to a water body, uh, which moderated the climate a little bit, improved the, the climatic conditions uh, uh, compared to more inland locations. They also offered access to a port, which enabled trade. The inland locations uh, also offered, um, in, some, in some instances, uh, the ability to moderate the climate, for example, being at a higher altitude, similarly uh, to the case of, uh, of uh, the city of Taif, for example, in Saudi Arabia. And some of them were, had access to um, navigable rivers, which again gave them trade advantages. Uh, and this trade, this, this point about trade between these settlements and also beyond them, inevitably favored some locations over others, uh, enabling some of those to grow further and to, and to prosper. And this is, for example, why the city of Ma'rib, the city of Najran, uh, Mecca and Medina and Tabuk and Gaza have all grown uh, along the frankincense route to the Tariq al-Liban. And also why the cities of Rey and uh, Mosul and Damascus uh, uh, and Tabuk, uh, sorry, not Tabuk, and, and Halab and, and Tripoli have also grown along the, uh, the Silk Route. And maritime trade, be that in the Mediterranean, the Red Sea or the Arabian Sea, have also allowed some port cities to grow and prosper as well. And that includes uh, Aden and city of Mukha and, and Jeddah and Alexandria as well. And, and, and as these cities grew, uh, some of the best forms of traditional urbanism has emerged. And we have seen some fairly environmentally responsive urban forms uh, that largely stayed within their um, ecological boundaries emerge in these cities or these settlements as they were at the time. They grew fairly organically uh, and they remained, as I say, um, within the environmental conditions that surrounded them. But with industrialization and globalization, the cities of this region have transformed. Their consumption patterns have changed from what was immediately available to them and their immediate hinterland to what was, um, to what was accessible, what, would find, what was financially uh, viable for them to purchase, regardless of where its location was. Um, and as a result, the glo this globalization or this, this uh, global trade has transformed or uh, globalized the hinterland, the global hinterland, and enabling cities which lacked um, water and biocapacity, for example, such as cities of the Middle East and North Africa, to basically import those commodities. And also, also technology has also enabled over extraction, for example, allowing cities of this, of this region to borrow water, for example, through over extraction from future generations. Uh, so obviously cities of this region are all the same, and there are distinctions between sub-regions of this, uh, of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some, a little bit about some of, the, some of these um, uh, uh, distinctions between them. For example, cities in the fossil fuel exporting in, uh, economies of this region uh, grew exponentially. They grew by orders of magnitude only within a few decades. Um, and they did that using trade surpluses by selling fossil fuels, obviously, uh, which enabled the importation of food, virtual water, and also technologies that 
help them moderate indoor, indoor qualities, for example, um, air conditioning, but also desalination as well. Um, and while there, this growth was absolutely phenomenal and it was outstanding in terms of the speed uh, at which these cities grew, uh, it also conveyed a false sense of resource abundance, which masked the, the fundamental environmental conditions within which these cities uh, emerged. Uh, the traditional cities of of the region or as they were settlements um, which had as i described emerged in a more organic way using traditional urban urban forms they've also they have also grown they have grown with this uh, globalization of hinterland so they've no longer grew organically but instead have grown quite exponentially into the metropoles that we now know today um, and, and despite lacking the same trade surpluses that were um, uh, available to the um, oil fossil fuel exporting economies, the oil and gas exporting economies, they still exceeded their ecological boundaries and they also exceeded their financial resources as well. And, and definitely have, they have abandoned that traditional urban form um, that they had at one point in favor of less ecological, less environmentally appropriate urban form and more imported ones and hybrids of the two. Um, and as these cities grew, internal dynamics emerged. The agglomeration effect, the networking effect, the economies of scale have also made these cities more attractive. So they acted as magnets that drew more people into them. Uh, so we saw a lot of urban to rural migration and urbanization rapidly rose within these cities over the last um, 60 years or 70 years or so. We have seen um, rapid urbanization across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the region is now truly urban. Two thirds of the population of the Middle East and North Africa lives in urban areas. Um, and this is particularly the case in the GCC cities, which are highly urbanized and mostly above 80% urbanized. 80% of the population of the GCC lives in urban areas. Um, but also the rest of the region is highly urban with the exception of Yemen and, and Egypt, which remain, uh, continue to have a, a rural uh, majority. And with this urbanization, the urban areas grew, grew as well. Um, uh, and theoretically, this growth has promised us uh, some form of economic benefit. So they promise, promise us some environmental benefits related to resource, um, to, to the resource consumption. Cities tend to have, theoretically, a more efficient resource consumption, be that economic uh, or environmental in terms of the resource, uh, material resource consumption. But unfortunately, the cities of this region did not reap the benefits um, that were promised um, by, by, the, um, by this urbanization process. And I would argue here that the heart of this failure lies a number of challenges, and I will call them sustainability challenges. These are planning ones relating to density, relating to land use, urban mobility, um, buildings, and, and water. And I will go through these um, quickly. So on the density issue, with the planning density and land use issue, two issues at the core of, of all planning decisions, the region, the region has a range of urban density. It ranges from 12 persons per hectare, quite low density, up to 20 times that much, about 250 is the highest that I have seen. Um, the cities of North Africa and the Levant tend to have a higher urban density, higher number of people in a, in, in a, in a, given, um, in a given area, a given urban area. Um, but and the GCC tends to have the lowest urban area. And while there's a whole debate as to what constitutes good urban density for sustainability, uh, the UN habitat, for example, suggests 150 person per, per hectare. Um, there's a, there are other studies that suggest that there is a range that perhaps goes between 150 to 200 or so uh, persons per hectare for good urban sustainability. Again, it all depends on the metrics you use. Uh, but as you can see on this, on this diagram, most of the cities of this region, large and small, tend to fall uh, below, that, below that threshold. And the problem with low density, and before I go into the, the low density, I also wanted to say that the, 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 issue, the other issue with, um, with density, that's the density has been dropping globally uh, year on year, so that we have seen an annual drop in urban density in this region, which reflected the global pattern of uh, dropping or reduction in, in urban density. So basically, urban areas are growing faster than the urban populations are. And the problem with urban density is that it reduces the viability of mass transportation. It discourages non-motorized mobility, so people are less inclined to walk and cycle. Uh, it reduces the energy efficiency of buildings, and it increases the resource consumption uh, when you lay infrastructure runs, for example, or when you lay, lay um, uh, uh, roads, for example. Uh, with that comes the issue of single-use zoning, which, is a, which often comes with low density, uh, which reduces the the, 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 which increases the demand for mobility because you're more inclined to walk or to, to take transportation 
uh, from the residential zone into a commercial zone, for example, it reduces accessibility and diversity of uses within any given neighborhood, and it limits non-motorized mobility. People are less likely to walk um, in, those, in those single zone areas. The second sustainability challenge, as I, as I described them, is urban mobility. And, this, and, and I would argue that the infrastructure of the region as a whole, the mobility infrastructure of the region as a whole, is designed for private vehicles. And that uh, comes at the expense of public transportation, it comes at the expense of walking and cycling. Obviously, there are, there are uh, variations, uh, there are good examples of public transportation networks in some cities, but as a whole, this tends to be the, the, the trend across the MENA region. Uh, there's, the, the region also lacks reliable and efficient public transportation networks, partly because of that legacy of the infrastructure being biased towards uh, per, towards vehicles. And on top of that, we have the issue of subsidies, which disincentivizes any effort to uh, integrate energy efficiency in the mobility network because the price is too low. Um, the third challenge is buildings. The cities of the region have a range of heating and cooling or conditioning of uh, the spaces in, inside a building. So some cities, for example, need more cooling. For example, you see at the top of the diagram here, the cities at the top, or the, the, the part at the top is the amount of cooling required annually. And the, the bottom part describes the amount of heating required annually. And there's a range of cities. And in the and you, on the right-hand side, you see there's a lot of Iranian and Turkish cities which require a lot more heating than cooling. And on the left-hand side, you find a lot of GCC cities which require a lot more cooling than heating, which is not surprising. And in the middle zone here, that green zone, um, is, the, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is the, it's basically reflects the coastline of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Southeast Mediterranean between the city of Lathakaya in Syria and uh, Laskandaria. And, and it basically requires very little heating and cooling compared to everywhere else. But if you are anywhere else, you would need um, a lot of heating and cooling to moderate these temperatures or this amount, the, the, the extreme uh, conditions, extreme outdoor conditions that are beyond the uh, thermal comfort required by people. So that heating and cooling um, is often undermined by the building stock that we have in the region. And the building stock of this region has poorly insulated houses, it has highly glazed ratio of buildings, and it also, um, and also has a stock of mechanical equipment, so um, HVAC systems that are not particularly efficient. And on top of that, electricity prices are also subsidized. This has also improved. Um, fuel prices have improved and electricity prices have improved over the last six or seven years across the region, uh, but they remain quite low um, or low enough not to provide enough incentive for energy efficiency measure to be integrated at scale. Um, the last sustainability challenge, in my opinion, is water. Obviously, water scarcity has created the need for desalination, um, mostly in the GCC, but elsewhere in the region. And this need for desalination has a huge energy, um, carbon emissions, and environmental footprint. Uh, desalination is technology has been improving, especially in the last two or three years, but this is not materialized into an infrastructure uh, that, is a light, that has a lighter footprint yet. Uh, on top of that, we have direct and indirect um, water subsidies, which again uh, limit our ability to integrate water efficiency into, into this, those cities. And one way in which we can measure all of these issues, it's, one, it's just one metric, one way in which we can measure all of these issues uh, is to look at the carbon emissions. And it allows us to gauge to what extent some of those metrics have materialized, um, some, some of those challenges have materialized uh, in terms of the ability of cities to capture those economic and environmental benefits promised by urbanization. And, and, and granted, the cities of this region or countries of this region don't emit a significant amount of carbon. Most of them are under 1% of global emissions, with the exception of uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey, and only Saudi Arabia uh, and, and Iran are amongst the top 10 uh, carbon emitters. And if you look historically, you'll find that going back, um, the region did not contribute or does not have a historical responsibility for the amount of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today. Uh, so there is little, um, there's little alarm from that point of view. But if you look at the trends, you'll find that carbon emissions in the MENA region, and to a lesser extent in the Arab world, have been rising much faster than the global average, um, especially over the last 40 years or so. And as a matter of fact, a few, if you consider all the different factors relating to carbon emissions, you'll find that in the 40 years between 1975 and 2014, car carbon emissions in the MENA region, and then or put it this way, the MENA region is the only region in the world where 
total carbon emissions have been growing, as you can see in the red circles there. Um, carbon emissions per capita has been growing, as you can see in the vertical axis, and carbon emissions per dollar of GDP has been growing, as you can see on the horizontal axis. Um, and if you break that down by country, you'll find that these trends exist to, to more or less in different, uh, more or less in different countries. But there's there's certainly an inefficiency in um, the the economy vis-a-vis -vis carbon emissions. There there's too much carbon emissions going on during those four, 40 years. There's a growth in carbon emissions going on at the same time when urbanization, the same 40 years when urbanization has been happening, carbon emissions has been growing, which suggests that there are, the, that there are other factors at play and that the cities did not manage to, at least from that carbon emissions metric, did not manage to capitalize on the benefits that urbanization could have allowed it to. And cities are very much at the heart of these carbon emissions issue in the MENA region, as well as globally, about 47, 48% of uh, emissions are related to the built environment that includes transportation and, and also um, heating um, and electricity use. Um, but obviously sustainability is not the only challenge facing um, the cities uh, of this region. There are all, the cities of the region are also susceptible to uh, a range of shocks and stresses uh, that undermine its operation today and they're also um, highly at risk from climate change uh, which threatens its future. And the reason uh, the region, uh, the city is highly susceptible to uh, some of these resilient, I'll call them resilience issues, is um, structural in the way the cities have uh, been planned so far. So for example, most of the urban systems in this, in, uh, or by urban systems, I mean the water systems, the energy systems, um, the mobility systems, for example, uh, they all lack diversity and flexibility. So the cities of the region are mostly dependent on one or two energy sources for electricity, they're dependent on one or two water sources for the fresh water, and they're dependent mostly on one mobility mode, which is a private vehicle. So the, and the problem with this lack of diversity and flexibility is if you um, have an issue with um, mobility, for example, if you have two accidents on two ends of a city, uh, two serious accidents, it could bring the operation of the city to a standstill, which is a very uh, serious issue from a resilience point of view. If you had multiple layers of multiple systems, say, for example, an underground network, then that would uh, act as a backup of sorts, or at least mitigate to some extent the limits, uh, shock, mitigate the, sh the, the extent the shock could affect the city. Uh, the other issue is, the, um, is the, 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 the existence of significant amount of uh, informal urbanism across the region, and these are highly susceptible to any kind of shock. They're not, they don't have the same level of resilience, and we even have informal urban systems in some cities such as Beirut, where you have informal mobility, informal energy, and informal water systems as well, not just the urbanism itself. Um, the social fragility is very high in the cities of this region. We've, we have continuous ur population growth, uh, continue at a high rate. Uh, urbanization is still continues, uh, continuing, and we have uh, internally displaced people and refugees across border, and we have um, urban conflicts, conflicts that actually happen within in the context of cities. Um, on top of that, we have the issue of climate change, which is a future uh, risk to cities of this region. And, and uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its reports classifies the MENA region as highly vulnerable to climate change. Um, uniquely, this vulnerability to climate change, according to the IPCC, is disproportionate. It's disproportionate to the responsibility of the region in terms of emissions, the region's responsibility for climate change is less than its vulnerability to it. Um, so for, for example, the region has emitted less carbon than, it's, than the amount of uh, risks or amount of carbon, uh, climate change impacts that it's expected to receive. It's also disproportionate to, to the region's share of uh, the global population. It's disproportionate to the region's share of uh, the, the uh, global economy as well. And we are expecting quite serious impacts in terms of climate change. We're expecting reduced rainfall, uh, where it actually does rain. Uh, we're expecting longer droughts. Uh, the, the risks to the Levant, for example, or, or to the Eastern Mediterranean is about a, quarter, a loss of about a quarter of precipitation, a quarter of rainfall. Uh, we're looking at even more, about 30 to 40 percent reduction in precipitation in Northwest Africa. And these, these happen, uh, these predictions vary slightly between different uh, assessments, but they remain consistent um, across multiple climate change scenarios. And with that, we're also expecting a uh, higher variability of rainfall, which means less reliable rain-fed agriculture, which will affect food security on top of this. Um, and we're also expecting a growth through the arid area, so we're expecting an expansion of the desert at the edges. Uh, we're expecting an increase in average temperatures, which, which varies from one climate uh, scenario to the other. And we're expecting an increase um, 
of maximum temperatures. These will tend to be worse in inland cities than they are in coastal cities. The one alarming study that everyone keeps referring to is the risk to um, cities around the, around the Gulf, especially the, uh, the southern uh, littoral of the Gulf, where we're expected to see the combined effect of what of, of temperature and humidity lead to um, very high wet bulb temperature, which is a hybrid uh, metric that combines both uh, temperature and humidity, uh, reach, reach limits of around 35. And, and at 35, the human, is less, the human body is less able to adapt uh, to temperature and is, is able to regulate the temperature. So it becomes basically, under the worst case scenario, um, sometime by 2070 up to the end of the century, uh, there will be days where it will be fatal to be outside for a few hours. Um, the variability of rainfall will also bring with it uh, extreme weather events or an increase in the potential of having extreme weather events, which poses a particular risk to cities that are highly susceptible to that. So for example, cities, cities such as Muscat or Jeddah, and for those of you who are familiar with these cities, uh, are highly susceptible, and even cities such as Amman, they're highly susceptible because of their geography uh, and topography um, to extreme weather events, and that, that tends to disrupt their operation quite quite significantly. Um, finally, the final resilience challenge I want to talk about is uh, sea level rise. Sea level rise is a, is a very slow process, um, almost imperceptible, uh, but one just before I raise alarms too much, um, one must keep in mind that about half of the population of this region lives within 100 kilometers of the coastline. Um, and as a result, as uh, one meter of sea level rise, which is uh, the consensus of where a sea level rise is expected to happen by the end of the century or expected to reach by the end of the century could reach 40,000 square kilometers, could affect millions of people, could affect tens of cities. Um, this obviously varies from one region to the other, but the Nile Delta is highly at risk, southern Iraq is highly at risk, some of the coastal, the coastal cities of the Gulf are also highly at risk. Um, but particularly at uh, risk are the um, backfill developments that we see into the, into the water, which tend to have very low uh, elevation. Um, and as, and all, the eleva all the elevated land as well uh, tend to have that same problem. And they're particularly, highly, particularly at risk um, because of their, um, the nature of the development itself. So, so I've talked a little bit about urban resilience. I've talked about a little bit about urban sustainability. And then the question is, how do you reconcile these two? And how do we, how do we achieve these? And, 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 and are they even compatible? And I would argue that, the, the, theoretically, that the notions of um, sustainability and resilience are um, they're related. So, so they, sometimes they have contradictions. Sometimes they have synergies between them. Um, but in the context of the region, the Middle East and North Africa region, there are specific um, complications. One is that the, 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 the sustainability notion um, has a steady state mentality in it. It assumes that cities can remain in a, in a constant state for a very long time if you design them right, uh, which is um, incompatible, in my opinion, uh, with the continuous social and economic shocks and stresses that the region goes through. For example, the continuous population growth, um, all the migration and, and, and even the conflict itself, and some of the, some, also some of the effects of extreme weather on top of that. And, the, and these shocks um, disrupt this idea of a steady state sustainable city. Uh, on top of that, the, the, the standard resilience notion of bouncing back from a shock. So for example, you get a hurricane or a dust storm and the city manages that, or you get a major disruption to mobility or to energy or to water networks, and you manage to bounce back from that. The problem with this idea in the context of Middle East and North Africa is that you bounce back to the unsustainable condition at which you were before that. Uh, so bouncing back is not necessarily compatible. It's not, it's not the, the outcome we desire. What, what we really need is a hybrid approach and, and regional cities need to be able to use this resilience, use this bouncing back, but bounce back to something else, bounce back to a new state, a new more sustainable state. And all these resilience ideas that we need to integrate into cities to maintain their operation need to enable us to do that transformation. And similarly, sustainability measures that we integrate into the cities of this region must also ensure their long-term resilience. So, so what we really are looking for are synergies between the sustainability measures and the resilience measures. And, and I'm sure you're wondering, so how do, you, how do you achieve these synergies and how do you do that systematically every time when you're, when you're looking at a given city in this region? Because obviously cities do have their unique characteristics and their unique, unique needs. And allow me to propose to you a, 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 
strategy for doing this. Um, and, and but before I do that, I'll have to break down the hardware of the cities of this region into urban systems. And, uh, and I will do that by breaking it into two parts, the spaces and the flows that happen within these spaces. The spaces will include the urban form, uh, the urban ecosystems, the microclimate, energy, water, food, stormwater, mobility, and material use uh, and solid waste. Um, and on top of that, you'll have the, the resilience um, agenda, which is increasing the capacity of a city to survive and adapt and grow despite the shocks and stresses. And on the other hand, you have this the sustainability agenda, which is reducing the overall fr uh, footprint of the city, the environmental footprint, while maintaining its functionality. And these two agendas, if you lay them on top of these um, 10 urban systems, be that spaces or the flows within the spaces or flow of the networks within those spaces, you end up with a range of targets and a range of goals. And these goals are, some of them are sustainability goals, some of them are resilience goals. So on top, for example, you've got the uh, resilience goals that I've suggested here, for example, um, um, solid waste management, uh, water security, food security, uh, energy security, reliable mobility, and a, an urban form that has climate, climate resilience. While on the sustainability side of the same systems, um, reducing demand for materials, water efficiency, energy efficiency, um, resource efficient mobility and resource efficient urban form. And naturally, um, and naturally these goals are connected. They're connected within each system, but they're also connected between the different systems. And once you start thinking about your strategies, or sorry, your, your measures, the measures that you're gonna integrate into, um, into a city that you're trying to retrofit to become more sustainable and resilient, you start laying these measures within the spectrum between what serves sustainability and what serves resilience or what serves sustainability more than resilience and vice versa. I'm not gonna go through all of this, all those measures that I'm um, proposing here, but I will highlight a few points. Uh, one is that some resilience measures such as diversification, for example, are resilience, primarily resilience measures. So if you, you're diversifying your um, energy sources in order to um, make sure that if one of them is disrupted, that the, some parts of the city continue operation. This di idea of diversification can, only, can also serve sustainability because you could always diversify into more sustainable modes of or sustainable energy sources. You could do the same thing with, with water. You could do the same thing with mobility as well. Likewise, reducing your demand, for example, demand for materials, demand for water, um, demand for, um, for mobility by maximizing walking and cycling, for example, uh, also helps support resilience uh, in, a, in, a, in the opposite way by reducing the overall demand in the city, reducing the overall stress on the city. And some, some measures which lie in the, in the middle tend to serve um, both, both resilience, the resilience agenda and the sustainability agenda equally. But I'm sure as you've guessed, all of these measures are interconnected. And it's this interconnection that we could map. And, and through this interconnection map, we could highlight uh, which measures can help us um, ma maximize the synergies, maximize the benefit by serving multiple systems, serving sustainability, the sustainability agenda and the resilience agenda simultaneously. For example, um, I will highlight some of the ones, and you could, you could, even, you could see it um, by looking um, at the at the interconnections here, you can see which ones are more central to the process, or se more central to achieving multiple multiple impacts on other measures as well. So, for example, a lot of the planning measures uh, like density and street networks, uh, street uh, the urban form, land use are particularly critical, and they affect everything. And these achieve multiple benefits across systems and across sustainability and resilience. Likewise with multimodal mass transportation, likewise with green infrastructure, urban agriculture, and smart city technologies. So there are opportunities here, if we think about this systematically, to identify intervention points, especially if the city is cash strapped or doesn't have enough resources to do everything, to highlight the best points of intervention, where if it spends enough money, it can achieve multiple benefits, multiple urban systems, um, serving its sustainability and its resilience agenda. And um, before I end, I would like to leave on a relatively positive note that if we, will, if we wait long enough for about 30,000 years or so, the earth axis will shift back. It will go back by the same two degrees it has shifted and the bands to the north and south of the equator will in fact return from the deserts they currently are into the grasslands they used to be once. Um, 
there will be more water back then, but at that time, and there will be more bio, bio capacity uh, for human settlements that exist within this region. But if you're unwilling to wait that long, then I'd be happy to talk to you about um, how do we ma make, a, make an effort towards integrating sustainability and resilience um, within the cities of the MENA region. And I've le I'm leaving my contact details, both my corporate and my uh, nonprofit uh, contact details for those who want to get in touch afterwards. And with that, I would like to thank you all very much for, for listening. Thank you, Mr. Karim. Uh, it was very informative, actually, topic. Uh, I, I just meant to notify everyone to, to send their questions. Uh, shall we start directly? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, this is Dr. Isam. Uh, question, are we setting the bar too high or the other reasons behind the practice that are causing us to face failure, sustainability? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the everything. Could you could raise your voice okay. a little bit. Okay, are we setting the bar too high or the other reasons behind the practice that are causing us to, the, to face failure? In terms of what are we setting it too high? Is it, uh, For sorry. sustainability, yes. No, 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 we're not. In terms of the sustainability uh, agenda, we're not setting it too high um, because we have certainly exceeded the, the, mm. um, the boundaries within which the cities can operate. We use far too much water. We've overused our water. And so at one point or another, someone will not find enough water. Um, in terms of the resilience, it's, a, it's, a, it's an essential issue to maintaining the operation of the city. So there's no, um, these, these are serious issues that relate to how we could continue operating the cities of today, um, 50 years from now. The climate change challenges are not going to go away. We're not, th th these are real things that will happen to the cities of this region if the climate models are correct. So we're, they're not aspirations for polar bears. They're aspirations for the city. Uh, and, and if we care about future generations continuing to live in cities of this region, um, then we should make some effort into making them uh, continue their operation into decades to come. Okay, this question from Engineer Moose, I think, is designation sustainable or could it be used in more sustainable ways uh, so as not to affect sea levels, marine organisms or the environment? Sorry, desalination did you say? Yes. So desalination uh, has two issues. One is uh, the energy source and the moment um, a lot of desalination happens um, using excess heat from uh, the energy, um, from the power plants. And there are also um, reverse osmosis desalination plants which use uh, electricity uh, and which are more efficient, but they don't use excess heat from the power plants. Um, so there, uh, at the moment, the current practice, the current desalination plants in existence across the region are of the old type, the thermal ones, which use an awful lot of energy still, and the overall energy footprint remains quite high. Um, the new reverse osmosis ones, which have not been deployed at scale yet, um, will, could be, could be uh, 10 times as efficient in terms of energy use. If we manage to do that, that would be great, but that will leave us with the issue of brine. And there are attempts in some parts of the region to deal with the issue of brine and not to discharge that into, into the Gulf. For example, the, the Gulf has, over the last uh, 20 years or so, it has gone 2% more saline because of the discharge of brine from desalination plants. It has also gone a little bit warmer as a result. The Gulf is a specific location because the water takes about five to seven years to circulate within the Gulf. Um, so it, it, it retains a lot of the characteristics um, of the materials that gets discharged into, unlike most other seas, um, but um, but that issue remains universal el everywhere. The issue of how do you deal with the brine? So two issues. Yeah, uh, I have a question, but the name is not clear. The question is: Is resilience in the, this contest the same as adaptation? Sorry, what this was the, the first? first one? The first part is resilience in this context as the same as adaptation. So uh, in, the, in, climate, in the climate lingo, uh, mitigation and adaptation can be applied as sustainability and resilience within mm -hmm. the urban context. So um, climate adaptation can be called urban resilience in the context of cities. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts about, let's say, UCC carbon economy in urban context? Uh, the carbon economy is a fairly interesting idea. It's obviously been uh, championed um, by Saudi Arabia in, in recent months. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting concept. Uh, I haven't uh, seen a fully formed version of it. I've personally done some work when it comes to cities, um, mm. but it, it remains uh, to be a conceptual idea so far, but it's a very interesting one. 
Okay. Uh, this question from Dima. How are how there are carbon emissions in oceans illustrated in the, some slides that you presented? We've seen some carbon emissions in oceans. How that can be? Um, I'm not 100% sure which slide. Uh, the emotions don't emit carbon, they absorb carbon. And they are one, one of the major carbon sinks. I might, they might have seen something incorrectly on the slides, but the oceans do not emit carbon. Oh. As a matter of fact, they are one of our first lines of defense in absorbing mm. much of the carbon. Um, and they will soon reach their capacity in terms of how much carbon they will absorb. Okay. Um, I'm waiting if we have more questions because we, uh, we answered most of them, most of them are repeated actually, so we highlighted most of the questions. Okay, this is... <clears throat> okay, uh, this question from Rania. Uh, Mr. Jen, do you think the most, the construction uh, the most construction of tall towers in MENA region lately is one of the major causes of growing carbon emissions. Towers, did you say? Yes. Um, uh, not necessarily, no. The, the, the form, the, ur the urban form of uh, standalone buildings, be that high rise or not, um, I wouldn't associate it immediately with an increase in carbon emissions. There are a lot of details to this in terms of the materials used and how much embodied carbon can go into a tower and how much energy use is built into the design of the tower. For example, if it's highly glazed, it's likely to have uh, significantly more um, operational carbon associated with the energy used to cool it. Um, depending on the construction materials, we will have a, a sign, uh, an amount of embodied carbon associated with it. Um, the height of it must on, only be considered in, in relation to the context uh, surrounding it. So low rise, for example, is not necessarily a good plan, as I've described in terms of the density issues, um, and this has been highly documented. Uh, while high rise, um, as in um, extremely high buildings, um, is not necessarily as associated unless we consider the context surrounding it, the amount of shading, the amount of uh, glazing, um, and the, also the amount of uh, the equipment used within it in order to improve its energy efficiency. So it can't, it can, I, cannot, um, uh, I, I cannot associate high-rise towers directly with high or low carbon emissions. Um, the one, one more question about um, the relationship between adapt, um, climate adaptation and resilience. The term resilience is um, currently limited, at least urban resilience is currently limited to the urban context, um, but it's also encompassing more than climate resilience or more than climate adaptation. It includes other types of shocks and stresses that can, feed, that can face the city um, that are not just climate change. And I've described some of those um, in my slides. Okay, this is a question from Inas. What's the effect, the effect of the mass human movement that happened in uh, such case of the Syrian refugees uh, senior of Jesus resettled in Jordan like Zachary camp on the climate change and how can we create more resilient and sustainable refugee camps? Um, I would defer you to those who have done uh, work on this. Uh, some of my colleagues, I'm happy to reach out if you reach out to me. I'm not an authority on Zachary, but I know people who are and who have done uh, work on improving the energy sources, for example, of Zachary camp and who have also observed the process in which Zachary camp has been modified uh, over the years. Uh, from what, where it, where it, how it was initially conceived to where it currently is. But I wouldn't consider myself to be an authority. In terms of people Sorry. movement, uh, I wouldn't say that there's an immediate association um, with the amount of, um, with, the, with immediate association with sustainability or unsustainability by these people moving from one location to the other. Uh, but in terms of uh, resilience and obviously well-being of, of these people, uh, certainly being in a refugee camp is not, uh, uh, is not good for anyone. Um, this question from Wassan, can we consider green buildings as sufficient progress towards sustainability or do we need more larger scale projects to tackle the issue in the region more sufficiently? So every new building uh, comes with additional carbon emissions, every new building in its construction and in its operations. So having a building that is slightly better um, than the business as usual building is still producing carbon emissions. Uh, if we, the, the best building is a building you don't build, basically. The, and where we currently are in terms of the carbon story, 
um, we would rather have no extra carbon emissions. We would rather aim for zero carbon emissions for existing buildings and for new buildings um, by 2050. The step that we have taken to integrate green building practices, um, partly by regulation, and, um, be that um, mandatory regulations or re green building rating systems, for example, has helped us transform the market into one that integrates measure to reduce the impact of the buildings um, that we currently are developing. Uh, but if we are to achieve those targets of uh, zero carbon emissions or zero operational carbon emissions, I must say, by 2050, then we need to know to do an awful lot more than we currently are doing. Okay. Uh, we have completed so far the questions that we had. Uh, I don't know if anyone is typing a question now, so we can take it, or we just can wrap up and... Uh, okay, we have a question. Uh, <clears throat> is there an... This is from Fusam. Is there an umbrella nation that includes both sustainability and resilience? Uh, no, they are actually quite contradictory terms sometimes. Uh, the idea of having, of that, I'll, I'll just give an example of where the contradictions are. So building multiple systems, just in case one of them fails, um, is an unsustainable thing to do. And, and uh, the, the, those who are pro-efficiency in energy use or material uses frown upon this idea because you're, it assumes that you're building redundancy into, into the urban systems. Um, so as a result, not, we can't, we can't we can't combine the two of them into um, uh, into into one term unfortunately but we have to use both lenses as I've described um, to maintain the operation of the city but also make sure it does not exceed the ecological boundaries that are um, uh, surrounding it okay I think we are done with the questions uh, if we, we can make, wait a little bit 30 seconds or something so we can go with the question. Uh, this is the last question, then we can wrap up. Uh, right. This is from Rola. If we back 20 years ago, MENA and GCC countries, we noticed that they had demonstrated some progress uh, achievements. As you mentioned uh, uh, previously now uh, about the city plan, about the vision that we had and the Green Riyadh, for example, project and other projects. Uh, maybe you've been involved in some of them uh, in generally, but how do you see that achievement in general? So there has been a significant amount of improvement um, in, in terms of policies, for example, there's uh, um, obviously all countries of the region have signed up to the Paris Agreement, so they're all um, in principle uh, agreeing to doing something about it. They all have um, a particularly nuanced vision in terms of how much mitigation and how much adaptation um, and some of them have a city's component to their um, uh, to their pledges within the Paris Agreement which is known as uh, nationally determined contributions but okay. also nationally at each at, at uh, national scale we have seen a growth in the amount of regulations uh, we have seen an improvement to uh, energy efficiency as a result of that we have seen an, uh, a reform of the subsidies uh, across the region especially where they're the subsidies were the highest and mostly in the GCC countries, but across the board. Um, and that was on the electricity side and also on the, um, uh, on, the on the fuel side. We have seen an, an, a pickup or a recognition of what green buildings can do and uh, some transformation of the market to or at least a component of the market to a more sustainable practices or less damaging practices, uh, I, I could call them. Um, so there are some, some interesting um, glimmers of hope if you like, um, but the scale of challenges, the sustainability and resilience challenges that face the cities of this region are such uh, that a lot more need to be done. I, I commend all uh, the, the, the policy um, measures that have been taken so far, and I think uh, we need to take an extra mile uh, to reach our goals. Okay, uh, this question from Anas, what is the role of a new architects these days? How can they contribute positively in this field? So the architects are quite central actually uh, to this process. Um, the architects are um, the integrators of everything to do with buildings and um, their role is to bring everyone in. Um, they, they find themselves in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly difficult situation in that construction industry has become extremely complicated and 
different disciplines have taken away different uh, components of the design process. Um, some of them, some of them gone to more other technical disciplines, and even sustainability has sometimes been um, uh, moved to other. Um, players within the design process to take care of. And architects uh, could reclaim that um, synthetical role where they will bring everyone together and synthesize a, uh, a design solution that captures all the different factors that shape the design of a new building. Um, and without the architects, we will not get sustainable buildings. Without the architects, we will not be able to achieve those net zero buildings or the buildings with low embodied mm -hmm. carbon, for example. It's not going to happen without their approval. And so we really need them to be on board and to um, get up to speed as to uh, how to implement, for example, passive design measures and how to uh, design envelopes uh, from day one in a way that um, captures the, the performance uh, and not leave those to uh, more technical design stages later on. And the earlier they do that, uh, the more likely we are to achieve our goals. Okay, we have a question from Abir. Is there a correlation between the size of the city in MENA and the carbon emissions and environmental risks? If yes, can we consider this call for medium-sized cities? Um, there is that call. It, that call does exist. I have not seen that correlation in terms of the performance. So there's this idea of the second tier cities and the, 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 um, the metropolises of the region, uh, the, the Kairos of the region uh, have grown too large and they're basically unfixable. You cannot turn them into sustainability. And let's, let's look at the second tier cities and try and focus on those in order to retrofit them in a way that transformed them towards sustainability and resilience and that we can do that better on those second tier cities rather than uh, the metropolises. I have not seen in the context of this region um, an evidence that the, the larger ones are, are performing less. Uh, this could be just because of lack of data, um, but it's certainly an interesting concept that I'm curious about, but I have not seen uh, evidence to support that positively or negatively. We still have a few minutes, so we have a few questions. Okay, to go? Okay. This yeah, sure. Rania, uh, we all know that carbon emissions are an effect of a lot of things, uh, like transportation, power generation, industrial processes and activities, commercial and residential causes, etc. What is the future of sensibility in terms of measures taken in various fields on an industrial level? Industri so by industrial level, we mean um, the heavy industries, for example. Could we, yeah. Should um, we? Yeah. Well, that's not really, strictly speaking, not cities. It's a, it's a different issue. Um, but there are multiple movements within um, the, the sphere of industry, which is, for example, having um, industrial ecologies, for example, where you use the byproduct from one industrial system into another. Um, uh, circular economies are certainly a growing movement to use materials or to extend the lifetime of materials to reduce the embodied carbon of creating new materials and also um, reduce the, the, the energy that goes into uh, making a new product. Um, and these, these are ongoing trends that are happening in parallel to every effort we talk about within cities. So cities will include um, buildings and mobility networks, for example. Uh, they don't necessarily include industrial facilities, but there are measures um, that are more significant um, than uh, what has happened so forth, Imp not just improve efficiency, but also introduce this idea of circularity and uh, reduce embodied carbon, and also um, have a more circular um, approach to, the in to having multiple systems, multiple um, industries in close proximity to each other in order to support each other from that perspective. Okay. So we're going to take the last question now from Musa. For, for countries that do not have access to the seas and doesn't have, or don't have the natural rivers and lakes, how do you reach sustainable development of water knowing that the rain and groundwater are also not non-sustainable? Non so, so my view is that not every city um, has a, emerges in a location that is conducive to sustainability. Mm. Um, and Cities, are, cities do not start from the same baseline. Uh, some of them have um, great amounts of water resources, for example. Some of them have none. Um, and those ones that don't will intrinsically resort to less sustainable measures. Um, so that be that desalination or um, depleting their aquifers and basically using their future generations water. Um, some, some 
countries are um, have a terrain that allows them to do hydropower, for example, have dams and 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 generate electricity in the most sustainable way, uh, at least from at least from a, um, a carbon emissions point of view, um, notwithstanding the issues relating to building dams and, and reservoirs. Other countries are more flat; they are unable to do the same thing. So the point here I'm trying to say is that not every location can end up being the same level of sustainability. And this is simply because of the geographic conditions and the environmental conditions within which they emerge. Um, and it's a very difficult question to answer as to what someone with unsustainable solutions should do or could do. Um, now, I wouldn't suggest that they need to move to somewhere else, uh, but I would argue that the ceiling of urban sustainability in different cities is different. Okay, so let's wrap up and with the advice, how, how architects and designers should aim to, to find solutions through their designs and projects, urban designs, etc. So I can speak at, the, at length yeah. about this. Um, um, so uh, architects and uh, designers in general, urban designers, for example, um, need to understand that in much of this region, the climate is harsh and whatever they do, they need to do everything in order to maintain um, comfort conditions in their buildings, for example, but also reduce the environmental footprints, the amount of energy used or water used, for example. So the passive design measures that we have inherited from um, traditional architecture could go to a certain extent. So it could help you improve um, indoor conditions by a certain amount, but they won't go all the way to what we now consider to be comfort because we have now devised a system um, and st certain standards that define what comfort actually is, which is different from what was defined uh, 300 years ago, uh, if it was. Now, so that means that the architects and designers need to do everything. They need to do passive design and they need to use mechanical systems and use to, and they need to do technologies such as smart city technologies on top of that. Uh, they basically need to apply everything in order to achieve the uh, sustainability levels that reduce amount of energy, for example, used. Uh, and that would include the lessons that we have learned, uh, in the inspiration, if you like, and, and also some actual physical, the actual physical design measures, but also uh, be open to the implementation of technology. There has been a school of architecture um, um, uh, in the last century that um, mostly resorted to passive design measures and did not integrate any technologies. Um, there's, there's been another school, which is exactly the opposite. And there's a hybrid school today, which aims to do that. And in my view, the architects should um, aim for that hybrid approach of integrating passive design, as well as efficient mechanical systems in order to achieve uh, well-performing buildings. In terms of urban designers, I think that's a different story. Um, urban designers deal with much more complicated issues. It includes uh, socioeconomic issues that need input are much more complicated and much harder to quantify. Um, they deal with um, city identity issues. Uh, they need, they, they, their, their role uh, upon urban designers is much more heavy uh, than it is upon uh, the architects who design a single building. And, and they need to um, juggle too many factors in order to achieve a sustainable development for a neighborhood for, or for um, uh, for a much more much much larger development. So, in my view, um, these are these are very um, detailed questions. That I'm happy to respond to at length, and I'll be happy to receive emails and and discuss those um, with whoever um, asked ask them. Thank you a lot, Mr. Karim, again, and uh, thank you everyone for being with us today. Uh, the time is over, and uh, thank you again for answering most of the questions. We couldn't answer get all of it on there, but this is actually a big perspective for it. Thank you a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thanks to thank your you. invitation. And thanks to everyone who's asked the question and those who've attended today. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, all thank of you. you showing up. Great. Thank you. Take care. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye -bye.